Hello, this is part of the controlled environment plant production engineering slash technology education modules that were developed and presented by the Ohio State University, Rutgers University, and the University of Arizona with support from the USDA NEFA program. This module discusses evaporative cooling and shading and is presented by AJ Both from Rutgers University and Murat Kassira and Jean Giacomelli from the University of Arizona. The learning objectives for this module are that by the end of this module you should be able to design an evaporative cooling system that increases the cooling capacity of naturally and mechanically ventilated greenhouses and that you should be able to implement a greenhouse shading strategy and improve the uniformity of the temperature distribution throughout a greenhouse. Additional resources include the Greenhouse Engineering Book by Aldrich and Bartok, Greenhouse Technology and Management by Nicolas Castilla, and Integrated Greenhouse Systems for Mild Climates by Christian von, von Sabeltitz. There are several ways that we can use evaporative cooling in greenhouse applications. The first one is the pad and fan system, followed by misting and fogging. The result is that by evaporative cooling, we drop the outdoor temperature as it comes into the greenhouse. That is, if the outdoor temperature or the incoming temperature is not, the indoor, incoming air is not already saturated, because if it's already saturated, we can no longer evaporate more moisture into it. And of course, by doing this, by doing this process of evaporation, we increase the overall humidity inside the greenhouse. So this could be an issue depending on what strategy you want to use to grow your crops. So here's an example of an evaporative cooling pad. It's typically located along an entire sidewall of a greenhouse on the sidewall where we have the ventilation inlet window. You can't see it in this picture, but behind the pad is the inlet window so the air comes in through the window and then has to travel through this evaporative cooling pad before it enters into the greenhouse environment. The pad is designed so that we add water to the top of it. So there's a pipe running the length of the evaporative cooling pad with little holes in it that uh, provide water to the pad material. The pad is made of an impregnated cardboard material that is uh, that allows for continued wetting and drying cycles without it breaking down very rapidly. And it's corrugated and then glued at angles uh, so that water can completely uh, flow through it, but it still allows openings for air to travel through. So there's good contact between the surface, the water surface, the wet surface, and the air coming through. And as a result, there's a lot of opportunity for evaporation to take place as the air comes into the greenhouse. So that evaporation process requires energy. It requires energy to uh, change water from a liquid to a vapor phase. And that energy is extracted from the incoming air. So as a result, we cool the air as it goes through this process. But at the same time, we humidify the air. Then at the bottom of the evaporative cooling pad, the excess water is collected typically in a trough and is then returned back to a tank or a sump so it can be reused uh, for the next uh, cycle or for a continuous cycle if you have it running continuously. So here's a, a close-up of what that pump and the return system look like. So on the, in the left-hand side, you see a part of the uh, heating system, that uh, pipe with rust on it. Next to it is the, the uh, pipe that runs from the pump to the top of the evaporative cooling pad where water is delivered. And then you see the trough underneath the pad where the excess water is collected and then returned through a pipe that you can just see a little white piece of going, in this case, to the outside of the greenhouse. On the outside of the greenhouse, it looks like this. You see a tank or a sump with on the left hand side a copper pipe running into it which is the supply line uh, towards the pump. So this is where, how the pump gets water out of the tank and runs it up to the top of the evaporative cooling pad. 
you see the white uh, PVC pipe that is the return line from the trough underneath the pads. And on the right hand side of the sump you see makeup water. And so this is all sitting outside the greenhouse in this case. You can also install this inside the greenhouse. There are a few challenges with a system like this. First of all is that when it is exposed to sunlight, the chance is that you get algae growing in a system like this. And so sometimes we like to cover a tank or make a tank black just to reduce the algae growth because algae can eventually clog up the system and, and make it less efficient. The other challenge is that uh, as water is evaporated, you need to make up the, the reservoir, the tank volume. And that's why we have the, the, uh, the line on the, left hand, on the right hand side here, uh, adding more water as is needed. So there's a float valve inside the tank that regulates the level of the volume uh, inside the tank. And um, if you did this over longer periods of time, then eventually the, the water in your sump becomes more salty. Uh, as water evaporates, the, any minerals or salts inside the water will stay behind. And so over time you can have salt build up in your system. And so what we typically do is we bleed off some of the return water, perhaps as much as 10%, and run it into a regular drain so as not to have too high of a salt, too high of a salt concentration in the system. The reason we want that salt concentration to maintain at reasonable levels is that if you don't, over time you see a salt build up on the pad surface material and that reduces the efficiency of the evaporative cooling system. The pad material lasts fairly long, about uh, three or four years at least, and then uh, when you see it deteriorate it's time to uh, replace it. So it's not uh, a one-time installation, you do have to replace them from time to time. Some information about how you design an evaporative cooling system. In this case, again, we're talking about the pad and fan system. There are different thicknesses of the pads that are used. The most typical thickness is four inches, but sometimes people use six inches. If you need to figure out what the total pad area is that's required for your greenhouse operation, you need to know what your total ventilation fan capacity is in cubic feet per minute, or CFM. And once you know that, uh, you divide that by a number of 250 to get the square footage of pad area you, when you use the 4 inch pad thickness. If you use a 6 inch pad thickness you do exactly the same except you divide the total fan CFM capacity by a number of 400. The pumping capacity required, so the size of the pump, um, the amount of volume that the pump needs to pump uh, in the system also depends on whether you use a 4 inch or a 6 inch pad. Uh, for the 4 inch pad you need a half a gallon per minute per linear foot of pad and for the 6 inch pad you need a little bit more, 0.75 gallons per minute per linear foot of pad material. The sump capacity or the tank capacity again depends on the thickness of the pad material. You need 3 quarters of a gallon per square foot of pad area for the 4 inch pad thickness and you need 1 gallon per square foot of pad area for the 6 inch pad thickness. If you want to know what the maximum water consumption is to have some idea of, of uh, how much water you need to provide to an evaporative cooling system, then uh, as a rule of thumb you can use a number of 1 gallon per minute per every 100 square feet of pad area. Now obviously this number will change depending on some extremer conditions. If you are in a desert environment where the air is very dry, where you have lots of opportunity for evaporative cooling, that number may be higher. But as a first approximation you can use one gallon per minute per 100 square feet of pad area. I already mentioned the need for a bleed off to prevent salt buildup on the pad material. Um, you need makeup water for your sump or your tank reservoir level uh, to make sure that uh, it doesn't run dry because of course water is evaporating in the system continuously when it's running. Uh, we talked about uh, algae growth that is possible in the system so anytime light can penetrate into the, the water volume you have an opportunity for algae to grow and, and cause a reduction in flow in your system. I showed you an, an example of a system where the tank was installed outside and typically we don't use an evaporative cooling system during the winter months when it's cold enough and we don't need 
additional cooling in the greenhouse. And in that case, obviously, you need to make sure you drain all the various components properly so that you have no uh, frost damage uh, as the system sits there during the winter time. We also recommend a filter system in the, in the, uh, somewhere in the, in the line of the recirculating system. Uh, although you use sometimes very clean water, uh, every once in a while you have particulate matter that ends up in the water stream and uh, think about the pipe on top of the evaporative cooling pad with the little holes to which we squirt water. Um, those can be clogged and once that happens you get areas in the pad that don't get wet and obviously do not contribute to evaporative cooling. So uh, putting in a filter is an easy uh, insurance for not having any particulate matter that could clog those little holes. Thinking about that pipe, um, it is typical to install that pipe with the little holes facing up and not facing down. And again, this is done so that any particulate matter that ends up in the, in the pipe is not clogging the little holes. Of course, that means that you have to have a cap over that pipe with the holes through which the water is squirting upward so that you can redirect that water down into the, uh, in the pad material. But by just rotating the pipe and making sure those holes are facing upward, you can, you can prevent yourself a lot of trouble by having to unclog those little holes uh, when you have particulate matter ending up in your water supply. And then, uh, as with most systems, you need to look at these uh, and the operation of this system very regularly, do proper maintenance and replace the pads in time so that the system continues to work uh, efficiently and, and uh, properly. Another evaporative cooling system is a misting system. Although misting systems are not typically used to uh, produce lots of cooling, although they can, um, but they're more used for providing a very humid environment for uh, rooting cuttings. Um, but nevertheless, you could use a misting system for, for evaporative cooling as well. So typically they have low pressures in the 40 to 60 psi range. Um, they have a relatively high volume of water that's coming through each of the nozzles, about four gallons per hour per nozzle. And we install approximately one nozzle for every 50 square feet of growing area. So there are relatively large droplet sizes coming out of these misting nozzles. And that means that there's an opportunity for, for wetting the leaf surfaces. And wet leaf surfaces can be good if you want to root cuttings, but in other cases where you try to keep plants disease-free, uh, that may not be such a good idea. So you have to understand the application and make sure that, that, you, that you don't mind having wet leaf surfaces when you use a misting system uh, in this application. They provide pretty good cooling uniformity, perhaps better than the evaporative cooling pad because we can put those nozzles throughout the greenhouse environment, whereas in the pad and fan system, the pad is installed on one side of the greenhouse, and although the cooling efficiency is pretty good, as the air moves through the greenhouse from the ventilation opening towards the fans, it picks up uh, heat energy and this heats up, and you get some non-uniformity of that cooling distribution throughout the greenhouse. We typically deliver the water through an overhead piping system when we use a misting system, so you have to have a place to install that. And it requires obviously a pump, uh, filters to try to prevent any clogging, and you need some controls to operate the system. So here's an example of what a misting system looks like, a uh, pretty foggy environment inside a greenhouse. Uh, mostly, as I said, used for uh, providing a, a, a very moist environment for uh, rooting cuttings. Uh, but it could also be used for uh, evaporative cooling purposes. The other system that we use, uh, which is specifically designed for evaporative cooling, is a fogging system. It works much the same as a misting system, except we use much higher pressures. We use less volume of water flowing through each nozzle, um, and therefore we create much finer droplet sizes. And the, the point of that is that those very, very small droplets evaporate very rapidly, and as a result, we try to prevent uh, any wetting of leaf surfaces in order to try to prevent any 
uh, disease issues as a result of that. So we use high pressures, 500 plus PSI, uh, perhaps as little as 1.2 gallons per hour per nozzle of, of water flow. And similar to the misting system, we put one nozzle for every 50 to perhaps 100 square foot of growing area. This provides really an excellent cooling uniformity. Again, we place those nozzles throughout the greenhouse environment, so it's more uniform than a pad and fan system. We also need an overhead plumbing system to provide water to the nozzles, and we require a high pressure pump. Uh, and now filters are very critical because the opening sizes are very small, so you need to have very clean water, and you need controls, obviously, to operate such a fogging system. Here's an example of a fog nozzle uh, generating this very fine mist, a very small droplet size. It's perhaps a little confusing looking at this picture, but this is a top-down view. It's hard to photograph a misting system when you're uh, facing upward uh, because light typically uh, uh, obscures the vision of this very fine mist that's being produced by the nozzles. One tool that we use to e evaluate how evaporative cooling systems work is the psychrometric chart. And I show you an example of a psychrometric chart here. Uh, so on the horizontal axis, we're looking at temperature, and on the vertical axis, we're looking at humidity ratio, which tells us something about how much water vapor is present in a quantity of dry air. So it tells us something about the humidity. So typically in greenhouse environments, we work with temperatures and relative humidities to characterize the condition, and the psychrometric charge allows us now to by knowing two conditions, for example, relative humidity and temperature, to quickly identify the other conditions that are important to understand what's happening with the air and what changes are occurring or can occur, for example, in an evaporative cooling system. So if we start out with a condition of 69 degrees Fahrenheit and 50% relative humidity, as you can see here, I indicated that by a little red circle somewhat in the middle of this, uh, this graph, um, you can then uh, quickly identify what the humidity ratio is. You can also read off from this chart what the specific volume, which is the inverse of the density, is. You can look at an energy uh, content or the enthalpy of the air. You can also uh, find quantities such as the wet bulb temperature and the dew point temperature. So the chart is really a tool that we use to, once we know two conditions of the air that we are dealing with, we can read off many other conditions uh, that are very useful for calculating and assessing what's happening and what can happen with the air present. So in this case, once we know the starting point and we know we're using an evaporative cooling system to reduce the temperature, all we need to do is to, to uh, follow the line of constant enthalpy to figure out what the wet bulb temperature is of the air that we started with. So air starting at 69 degrees Fahrenheit and 50% relative humidity has a wet bulb temperature of approximately 57 degrees Fahrenheit, just by looking at this graph. And so the wet bulb depression that we can uh, impose as a result of the evaporative cooling system is 12 degrees Fahrenheit by just simply subtracting 57 from the 69 we started with. But we know that no system is 100% efficient in cooling. For example, in the case of an evaporative cooling pad, we could have some nozzles that don't work properly, or we could have a region of the pad that is not quite wetted sufficiently for effective evaporative cooling. So it's a good rule of thumb to assume that the evaporative cooling system has an efficiency of 80%, and if we uh, multiply 0.8 by the, the wet bulb depression, we get to an effective cooling capacity of about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So what that tells us that Given our starting point of 69 degrees Fahrenheit and 50% relative humidity, using an evaporative cooling system, we should be able to lower the temperature by about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Shading systems are also important when you think about cooling greenhouses, and we have different strategies that we can use. Uh, a, a very simple strategy is whitewash, where we put a paint or a, a paint-like material on top of the glazing, um, and I'll show you an example of how we do that. 
Other systems allow for a little bit more control, such as movable curtains, and they can be installed both inside or, and outside the greenhouse. And some growers also uh, install exterior netting, uh, some of it movable, some of it more permanent, uh, all as a way to try to reduce the solar heat load coming into the greenhouse. So the benefits obviously is that we reduce the amount of solar energy coming into the greenhouse. Um, as a result, we reduce the plant leaf temperature so we can reduce uh, heat stress conditions on the plants. Um, these shading systems can help control the amount of light that plants receive. And by doing that, we can typically control the rate of growth. And um, these shade systems often have the capability because of their design characteristics to also retain energy, and this is very important, in the evenings and during colder months of the year. So they typically serve a dual purpose. They are both used for shading as well as for energy conservation. So here's an example of whitewash being applied. It's a paint-like material that's directly squirted onto, sprayed onto, in this case, a glass greenhouse. Um, it's an easy application. Uh, the challenge is that uh, once it's applied, it stays on uh, a relatively long amount of time before weather finally breaks it down and precipitation typically washes it away. So if you apply it during a period with, with high light conditions and after that it becomes overcast, uh, the paint stays on and uh, you reduce the light uh, coming into the greenhouse. So control is relatively uh, problematic, uh, but again, it's a very simple uh, way to reduce the, the, the energy, the, the heat load in coming into the greenhouse. An added advantage of some of these materials is that they diffuse the light, and diffused light is typically able to penetrate deeper into a typically a taller plant canopy, and as a result we see some advantages uh, over uh, structures that have, for example, glass that mostly uh, generate direct light. So. Um, in addition to uh, reducing the heat loads, it can also change the way light is penetrating into the structure and it can be of benefit uh, under certain conditions. As I mentioned, we also use interior curtains for uh, light reduction in greenhouses for shading applications. And here you see an example of a movable curtain installed in a, in a uh, wider bay greenhouse with a, with a tall peak roof and you see the curtain is installed over some of the heating pipes and other uh, supply pipes that run uh, the length of the greenhouse. Um, so you have a lot of control over these uh, curtain systems. You can open and close them uh, whenever you want and how much you want. Uh, however, if you look at the plants underneath, you see some clear shadow bands created by the curtain material. Um, so if you are partially opening or partially closing your curtain material, you do generate uh, brighter areas and, and darker areas in your greenhouse that may or may not be an issue for the plants growing underneath. So you have to be aware of that. Some growers decide to um, either have them completely opened or have them completely closed, but don't uh, use them in, at, at partial, in partial positions just for this reason. As I mentioned, these curtains can also be used for energy conservation, energy retention. Here you see a curtain being closed at the end of the day, the sun is setting, the curtain is being closed, and this is done so that um, we, we try to reduce as much as possible heat radiation from the warmer greenhouse environment to the outside uh, colder uh, sky temperature. So this, the curtain material serves a dual purpose. Some examples of uh, outside curtains, uh, on the left-hand side, a, a netting that's installed more or less permanently throughout the growing season. So once it's installed, it's not changed very much. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see two outside installations that can change, some of them manual, some of them on a computer-controlled system. Um, so you don't have to install it inside. You can also install these curtain materials on the outside of the structure. It's important to remember that uh, when you're using evaporative cooling systems and shading systems, it's important to maintain uniform conditions throughout the growing area. And so 
we have different systems that we use to try to improve the uniformity of the temperature distribution throughout uh, a greenhouse environment. Uh, thinking about heating systems, hot water systems are typically preferred over hot air systems because they are better capable of distributing that heat more uniformly. Floor and bench heating systems are really ideal if you're really concerned about uniformity of the heat distribution uh, because more uniform conditions typically result in more uniform plant growth. So if that's a major concern, then floor heating and bench heating systems are, are preferred. We can also use overhead polytubes or underbench polytubes both for heating and for cooling purposes. So we either distribute warm air or cold air through these tubes to try to improve the uniformity of the heat or the cold distribution throughout the greenhouse environment. And then we can use horizontal airflow fans. And I have a little bit more information on that in the next slide. Horizontal airflow fans are used to uh, generate uh, airflow patterns inside greenhouses that distribute heat um, and other conditions more uniformly. The desired airspeed that we typically like to design for is in the 50 to 100 feet per minute range. We need approximately three CFM or cubic feet per minute per square foot of floor area in a greenhouse to make sure we get enough capacity uh, to generate these uh, airflow patterns. The motors are typically pretty small on these fans so they don't require a lot of electricity to operate. We have a range of designs, but typically fan blades are in the 12 to 20 inch range, so not that big. Uh, it's recommended to have these fans equipped with a guard so that people working in the greenhouse don't get hit by the rotating fan blades. Usually we operate these fans continuously because we'd like to generate these patterns and maintain these airflow patterns. However, uh, as soon as the ventilation system kicks in, especially in a mechanically ventilated greenhouse, uh, the, the forces generated, the airflow patterns generated by the, me the mechanical ventilation system are typically much stronger than whatever airflow pattern we can, we can uh, get from horizontal airflow fans. So in that case, it may, it may be okay to switch the horizontal airflow fans off after we reach a certain rate of ventilation from a mechanical ventilation system. We install horizontal airflow fans typically in race tracks to try to establish and maintain steady airflow patterns in a greenhouse. And in some cases, horizontal airflow fans have been rotated, so they point straight down uh, to create direct airflow patterns hitting the, the leaf surfaces. And for some crops, for example, lettuce crops, that has shown to increase plant transpiration and as a result, increase the uptake of nutrients um, to try to prevent, for example, uh, a tip burn issue in, in lettuce crops. So here's an example of what a horizontal airflow system looks like in a greenhouse. On the fans on the left-hand side are pointing towards us, so air is blowing towards us, and on the right-hand sa side, the fans are pointing away from us, blowing the air in the opposite direction. So by running these fans continuously, you can create a racetrack pattern that provides for good mixing of the air inside the greenhouse environment. We'd like to acknowledge the funding that was received for this effort by the USDA NEFA program.